so glad to be tuned in with all of you this morning. And uh, we're going to continue our John series, and we're going to pick it up where we left off in John 8. But before we do, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Amen? Uh, Dearly Father, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your blessings, for your word, for your teachings. Thank you for uh, Ryan for just sharing his heart, uh, just just uh, singing powerfully, reminding us to uh, of all the incredible things you've done for us, God. So super grateful to be here with everyone, uh, though not physically, uh, but spiritually, God. Uh, please uh, work through me in a powerful way, God. Just help me to preach your word. Uh, as you uh, want me to preach your word, God. We love you. We thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So a little recap from last week. Last week, we looked at John 7, uh, where we have Jesus at the Festival of Tabernacles. And what is the Festival of Tabernacles? But a time of celebration, uh, reminding the Israelites of their desert march, of their 40 years in the desert, and how uh, God was with them during that entire time. So uh, this was one of the most anticipated festivals of the year, and people were excited. And uh, every, every single night uh, to uh, basically symbolize uh, God guiding the people at night with the, with the fire, they would, they would uh, light up uh, Jerusalem with all sorts of lights. So imagine this. It's like in today's terms, imagine the day after Christmas. And the day after Christmas, what happens? We take the tree outside, uh, we start taking the lights off, we start uh, putting the wrapper in paper, and we throw it away. And it's kind of a sad day. You're like, okay, well, it's all over. Now or what are we going to do? And, uh, and, and, and here we see Jesus meeting at the temple courts like he did every single day, teaching uh, in the synagogues. And uh, the, the focus for today is we're really going to focus on uh, the next three chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. And there's an incredible theme within here. Uh, and the title of my lesson today is simply, The Light of the World. So for the sake of time, we're not going to read text by text. We're going to focus in and hone in on a, on a couple of scriptures. In the beginning of chapter 8, where we left off from last week, we see Jesus teaching. And what do the Pharisees do? They actually uh, catch a, a woman in the act of adultery, and they bring her before Jesus. And why do they do this? They do this to try to catch Jesus, because in the Mosaic Law, if someone was uh, to commit adultery, they were to be stoned to death. Um, so they wanted to see, what is Jesus going to do? He's either going to say, yes, you need to stone this woman to death, or uh, not to. Either way, they were going to try to catch Jesus here. But what does Jesus do? Jesus, Jesus ignores uh, what, what their question. And um, it's interesting, too. You see the, the Pharisees' motives because they just brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. Uh, and and in, in the law, both would be brought forward and both would be stoned to death. And, and essentially, Jesus says, uh, you know, who, the, anyone who is without sin be the first one to throw the stone. And he sits there and he's writing on the ground. And a lot of scholars and historians believe that Jesus was actually writing accusations of these hidden sins of uh, these Pharisees. And as they saw them, they left one by one by one. And what does Jesus say to the woman? Woman, who, who stands here uh, to condemn you? And she says, no one. And he says, neither do I uh, go and stop living a life of sin. And to see, you know, in the same way, uh, we can be harsh with people that sin, right? We can be like, oh, that person over there, they're sinning. I see their sin. And why do we act like that? Because honestly, we often see our sin on other people. But to see God's heart, God's heart is to forgive that sin, to call us to repentance, to live a new life, and to uh, raise to a new life with Jesus. Amen? So we're going to pick it up here in verse 12. And uh, chapter 8 of John, and the Bible reads, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, and reminder here, the lights are coming down, the festival of tabernacles is over. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Wow. And we think about that. My first point today 
is turn on the lights. And I love this, you know, uh, here God was with the Israelites in the wilderness, being that, that pillar of fire guiding their way. And when that, that, the time has passed today, what is that, that pillar of fire? What is that light? Jesus is that light. Jesus is the one that's guiding our footsteps. You know, in the Hebrew Bible, light is often referred to as God's word. In Psalm 119, 105, the Bible reads, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And of course, in John 1, we learn that Jesus is the word that the word became flesh and the word was with God, right? So we see that Jesus was, is the word, but Jesus is also the light. And I don't know if you guys have ever uh, woken up in the middle of the night and, and stumbling, trying to turn the light on, uh, but you, you can't see, right? It's hard, you kind of fumble around. And in the same way, that's our life uh, before we turn on the light, that is Jesus. You know, I think about uh, my life just uh, chasing after all these different things, success, school, uh, relationships, partying, you name it. And uh, in a lot of ways, I was just kind of fumbling through my way of life. And it wasn't until someone sat down with me and studied the Bible. I, I can remember studying the Bible with Jeremiah Clark at this sandwich shop off of 13 and Agate, uh, which is no longer there. And uh, just seeing him shine the light, turning the light on for me, and me just feeling like, wow, this, this light is a little blinding. I don't know if I'm ready for this. And I, I walked away, right? And then I studied the Bible. And the brothers tried to turn the light on again. And I wasn't ready for it. But it wasn't until I allowed Jesus to turn that light on in my life that everything changed. That I allowed him to guide my footsteps and really change my life. You know, as it says here in the scriptures, when we follow Jesus, we walk in the light and no longer walk in the darkness. So again, my first point is we got to turn the light on and keep the light on. Amen. Even during this time of, of quarantine. So the question I have for all of you is, are you walking in the light? Are you keeping the lights on? You know, is Jesus still guiding your footsteps? Or have you allowed this pandemic, have you allowed this situation to guide your thoughts, your emotions, your decisions? And my inspiration to you guys is uh, something that Paul says to the Philippian church in Philippians 4, 7. Paul writes, And the peace of God, which transcends all of understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So again, when we keep the lights on, uh, Jesus is in control. That we can have a peace that goes beyond understanding. And that we can be that light to others where things seem pretty dim. Things seem, things seem pretty dark. Amen? So from there, uh, Jesus is met with opposition, uh, which are the, the Pharisees, the blind guides of the day. Because Jesus is the light. You know, and when you turn the light on, uh, do you... It's, you clearly see that there is light, right? And in the same way, Jesus had proved himself to be the light. But who are the Pharisees? They were these blind guides. That they wanted, they wanted uh, their own light. They wanted to do it their own way. And uh, we see this back and forth uh, discussion of the Pharisees disagreeing with Jesus. First they say, here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. In other words, uh, you need two people to testify in order for your testimony to be valid. And Jesus, of course, re uh, reminds them, well, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't go by human standards as I am God, God in the flesh, and I am my own. I testify for myself, and then the Father testifies for me. And then he says, where I am going, you cannot go. And then they say, well, where are you going? Or who is your father? Who is this father? Show me your father. And Jesus reminds them, you don't know the father. Because the father, if you knew the father, you would listen to me. And I'm reminded that if when we turn on the light, when we turn on the light, which is Jesus, we get to know who God is. We get to know who the father is. Uh, that we get to see uh, God's heart. That since the beginning of time, God has always desired for us to be in a relationship with him. Amen? So we see them kind of banter back and forth. 
and they say, where is your father? Uh, or uh, who's trying to, uh, where are you going? Who's, are you going to kill yourself? And of course, these are jabs at, at Jesus. And Jesus responds, you guys, you are of the, of beneath. You are of this world. I am from above. And because of that, you will die in your sin. And again, they say, who are you? And Jesus reminds them, I am who I've already told you who I am. I am the Messiah. I am uh, the Son of Man. I am the Father. You know, we see those I am statements time and time again. And we pick it up here in verse 27. They did not understand that he was telling them about his Father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed him. And what is Jesus talking about? Those, those uh, who lift up the Son of Man. He's talking about the crucifixion. That Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross. And at that time, people are going to know this was the Son of God. That this is the Messiah that died for our sins. And what happens? The, the, the uh, temple uh, curtain splits in half. Uh, these dead people start coming out of the ground. And, and people start res responding, surely this was the Son of Man. And we pick it up here in verse... 31. To the Jews who had believed him, in other words, that, that actually believed what Jesus was saying was true. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Wow. And I love this scripture because it's one thing to believe. That's the beginning, right? We have to have faith in Jesus. But it's one thing to intellectually understand who Jesus is, and it's another thing to put that faith into action. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do as his disciples, as Christians, to, to not only uh, believe in Jesus, but to abide in his word, to follow his teachings. And when we do that, we will know the truth, and we will be set free. What are we being set free of? Our sin, the life of sin that we left and no longer live in, but now we live for Christ. Amen? And of course, this is met with more opposition from the Pharisees. They say, we are Abraham's descendants, verse 33, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And of course, this, uh, this is absolutely not true. In fact, you look at Israelites' history, they're almost always enslaved to the people, to uh, a different nation, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and now even during this time, uh, though not technically, they're really enslaved to the Roman Empire, right? But why do they respond with accusations? Because they refuse, refuse to keep the lights on. Because they're still slaves to their sin. They're slaves to their pride. They're slaves to their self-righteousness. You know, in James 1, verse 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And in the same way for us, in order to keep the lights on, we have to listen to what God is telling us, but we need to put it in practice. Amen? In verse 48, the Bible reads, The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Again, they're throwing out insults. Before that said, We are not Ill illegitimate children. In other words, they were calling Jesus an illegitimate children because they didn't believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that it was an illegitimate child. But he says, verse 49, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Wow. And we're reminded when we turn the lights on, and we keep the lights on, and we abide in God's word, when we obey his commands, that the lights are going to stay on. 
that we don't have to worry about uh, just this life, but, but that we have all eternity to spend with God. Amen? So we're going to pick it up here in John chapter 9. So again, the first point is turn the lights on. The second point is shine the light. And we pick it up here in verse 1. And the Bible reads, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And why did they say this? Basically, they believed uh, the, the Jews were very superstitious. That they believed that you could even be sinful at birth even in the, the mother's womb. So they're asking, why is, why is he like this? But we know that, that uh, good things and bad things happen to the righteous, but they also happen to the wicked. And that, that's not even what it's about. It's that God can be glorified. Jesus responds in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Wow. And I think about that for us, too. You know, in the same way, we can look at our circumstance or this this pandemic, this quarantine. What, what is happening? God, why am I losing my job? Why am I uh, struggling about finances? Why do I have to have social distancing? Why, 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 why? And really, the answer is so God can be glorified. You know, if we have the lights turned on and we are shining bright, we have nothing to worry about. We know that God is going to take care of our needs. Amen. And the purpose of all of this, that God is working for the good of, of those that love him, that the purpose of this is for God to be glorified. Amen? Verse 4, it says, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Wow. And I think about that, and it's just a reminder. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. What happens during the day? We see the sun. The, sh the light is shining, right? And we got to ask ourselves, what are we doing with the daylight? Are we making the most of every opportunity? You know, this, uh, this situation is very different than anything we've ever been in. This is unprecedented times where uh, businesses are being shut down. We're asked to be staying in our homes unless getting our groceries or, or es essential needs. And, uh, we got to ask ourselves, are we, are we shining the light? You know, are we still digging into our scriptures with this extended amount of time? Are we, are we using it for God's glory? You know, are we using social media to share our testimony, to share our lives with friends, family, and the people that we come in contact with? You know, this is a credible opportunity for us to do so. In verse 6, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud, with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Wow. So get this. This is one of the most interesting uh, miracles that Jesus performs. And he essentially, he spits on the ground. He picks up some dirt. Uh, and of course, as men and women, we come from the dirt, right? We come from the God, the ground that God made us out of the ground, and He takes that and He makes some, He makes some uh, mud and He puts it on the man's eyes, right? And uh, at the same time, this man has to believe that Jesus can heal him. That it's not just okay, that sounds great, but now he actually, Jesus tells him specifically to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he does so. And in the same way, when we take our faith, our belief in God, belief in God, and put it into practice, that's when we see the miracles of God. The question I want to ask you guys is, do you see the miracles despite of all that is happening? What God is trying to do through all of this? Let's pick it up in verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who, is, who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? They asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. 
Wow. And I think about this, and in the same way, my second point again is, is shine the light. And here is uh, the blind man that can now see, and he's shining the light. He's sh sharing very plainly what Jesus did, what Jesus asked him to do. And Jesus tells him to, to go wash in the, in the pool of Siloam. And in the same way, what does Jesus ask us? Jesus says, go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And the promise is that he will be with us always. And it's the same thing here. He's just sharing what Jesus has done in his life. And in the same way, we have the incredible opportunity to share what God has done in our life. You know, that no longer am I living this life of sin, but now I am living this new life with Jesus. Amen? Let's keep reading in verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. It's interesting how Jesus just performed this miracle for the t first time ever, never recorded in the Old Testament, not with any of the, the, the prophets uh, or, or anyone, was a man that was born blind ever healed of his blindness. Yet they want to focus on the Sabbath, the Sabbath that was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But others ask, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind. But how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who had already decided that anyone who acknowledges that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Wow. And again, I love how this, the blind man just tells it to him straight. He's like, sinner or not, one thing I see is that I was blind and now that I can see. You know, that's incredible. This is clearly a man of God. But we continue to see the opposition. He answers, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <coughs> then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they reply, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Wow. And I love this interaction of the blind man because you see his boldness, that God had completely changed his life, that he had been blind for his entire life and now he can see. And because of that, he shares what Jesus had done in his life. He shines the light. And he does it with boldness, not even being afraid of being kicked out of the synagogues. And I love what he says here. He says, this is remarkable. This man healed me, and yet you want to call him a sinner. You want to call him demon-possessed. 
I'm pretty sure God doesn't answer the prayers of sinners, yet he healed my blindness. Wow. And I think in the same way, uh, are we sharing our testimony with others? Are we making the most of social media? You know, I think uh, for a lot of us, we can kind of fall into two camps. Some of us really uh, appreciate our alone time or are more introvertal, and some of us are more extrovertal, you know, and 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 it can be challenging for, for each of us. For those that are introverts, it's hard to, okay, I'm going to share boldly. I'm going to I'm going to put a video out there sharing my testimony about what God has done in my life because they're not comfortable being in the limelight, right? And then for the extrovert, they're uncomfortable because they're not surrounded by people and they feed off of other people's energies. So this is a time where we got to be bold, that we got to shine the light and really be an example to this lost world. Amen? Let's pick it up in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him, and in fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not feel guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Wow. And I think about this and it's like, why were the, why were the Pharisees giving this man such a hard time? Why did they want to deny Jesus? It's because of their sin. And I think of the scripture over in 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 3, and the Bible reads, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, and even to those who are now dead, so that they may be judged according to the human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Wow. And I think about that. It's like, why, why are they giving this blind man such a hard time? Why are they giving Jesus such a hard time? Because their sin is being revealed. And, and, and that's where it's challenging for them. And in the same way, we got to, we got to shine the light. We got to show this is not okay. This is where I had to repent in my life. I can relate, but we got to do it God's way. We got to abide in his word. And that, and when we abide, when we follow, when we obey, that's, that truth is what's going to set us free. Amen. Let's keep reading in chapter 10 to close on out here. My last point is to be the light. In verse 1, it says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. In other words, there's only one way to the Father. There's only one way to turn the lights on, and that is through Jesus. Verse 8. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may live and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. 
So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have the other sheep that are not in the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Wow. My third and last point again is to be the light. And I think about this, when we are the light, what are we supposed to be as Christians? To imitate Jesus, to be Christ-like. And when we do that, we become that light. We become that light that brings hope to this dark and lost world. And what does that look like? What are the practicals? To lay down our lives for one another, to lay down our lives for one for the sheep, uh, to spend time with one another, to take care of each other. You know, who is in need during this time? Who needs toilet paper? Who needs food? Who needs this, that, and the other? You know, uh, are we, are we uh, encouraging each other to get into the Bible, to go to God in prayer? You know, do we notice when the wolf is coming? Do we say, bro, don't go over there. Sis, don't go over there. There's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Or that's poison. Don't take that. Do we know the sheep and do the sheep know me? Are we gut level honest with where we at, where we're at? Do people know the good, the bad, and the ugly of our lives? And lastly, do we lay our lives down? So in closing, guys, let's turn the light on and keep the light on, which is Jesus. Let's shine that light to show people the truth and be that light, be that example. So with that said, let's go ahead and uh, be reminded of what God has done for us, that Jesus is that light. Let's be reminded of what Jesus did on the cross as we take communion, the, the bread that represents the body that was given up for us and the blood that was shed on the cross. Amen? So let's go to our Father in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your blessings, for your word, for your teachings. God, thank you for being the light of the world. Thank you for just being a guide, showing us uh, how to live our lives in a righteous manner, how to follow in your footsteps, Father. God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for uh, taking on our sin so that we may be free, that we may be forgiven. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So with that said, guys, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, Definitely uh, grateful to have you out. And I encourage you, uh, if you're visiting today, to to join us. To join us for some virtual Bible studies. Get with the the person that invited you out and study the Bible. See what it really means to uh, follow the light of the world. Thank you, guys. We love you. And to God be the glory. Amen.